We're going to be talking about color. We're going to be talking about color terminology. We're going to be talking about color basics, but that's where I want you to ask me stuff because you've all got color knowledge. We just don't know. Uh, I don't know what level your knowledge is at. Oh, thank you, Julie. Uh, we're also going to talk about color schemes. So, for example, in this one, I've used yellow and purple. And I'm also going to touch on color psychology, which is always absolutely fascinating. And we're just going to just, you know, barely touch on it. It's just something that you could do all day long. Okay, that's my practice painting from yesterday, and I did a video on that that I'll finish editing soon. I've got round paper. Uh, so we talked about this. Um, <laughs> we touched on round paper last week, and I found it online. This brand is Arteza. I haven't used it, so this will be the first time ever that I've used it. But naturally, lots of you aren't going to have round paper. Um, so I've got a paper plate and I will trace around the paper plate. So I'll do two, one on the round paper to test it out and one on some watercolour paper and we'll just trace our own circle. I've also got some watercolour books. I've got watercolour pears. I've got uh, watercolour crayons and I've got two yellows, two blues and two reds. So um, I've got cadmium yellow light, permanent yellow lemon, phthalo blue, cobalt blue, quinacridone magenta and permanent rose. But as long as you've got two yellows, two blues and two reds, there is a mass that we can make with just those few colours. All right, let's put that aside for a moment. Before we get into the psychology, I mentioned that, just going to zoom in on these books here, zoom right in so you can see these ones. Thanks, Dave. That is cool that it is all good. Wonderful. Okay, Dave came and um, <laughs> tried to help me, so that was brilliant. Okay, how's that? Oh, and it's focused. Wonderful. I have lots of books on colour theory because it's one of the things I absolutely love. This one is a Jan Kuntz. I'll put his name there. I think it's a man. I don't know. Could be Jan for all I know. Um, Watercolour Basics. Quite a lovely basic explanation about colour theory. I quite like it. Just getting my camera to focus there. It starts off with the three primaries, yellow, blue, and red, and then it builds on it. So it's a really good one. Thanks, Nina. So glad you all found me again. Um, it's a wonderful one for um, just building from base knowledge and building up. Uh, and it goes through how to build your own colour wheel, which I won't be doing online because it's a little bit tedious. It's the sort of thing you should just take your own time with, get a lovely reference like this one, Watercolour Basics. This one I first borrowed from the library. So there's lots you'll find in your local library. So that's Jan Kunz. I'm assuming it's Jan's because the name is so unusual. This is the other book that I Love, I actually love lots of the books that I own. I'm moving it up so you can see Jean Doby, Making Colour Sing. Not only is it full of these beautiful um, paintings, but it's got this wonderful list and in it, it lists the transparent colours and vivid staining transparent colours and then it goes into opaque colours and this artist only uses a transparent palette with occasional use of the other sort of colours that you can get there. And I'm very much into this idea that it, you've, of using beautifully transparent colours. Anyway, this book, awesome. That was Jean Doby, Making Colour Sing. And the final book that I'm just going to briefly mention is my absolute favourite, Colour Choices by uh, Stephen Quiller. Just move it up so you can see his name, Stephen Quiller. And um, his explanations are not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> They're very complex. But the art in it is extraordinary and he gives examples of every aspect of colour um, and then he 
uh, gives you examples. So it's the sort of thing that you could just own this book and be forever doing examples from it and learn so much about colour theory. And I absolutely love his suggestions uh, about how to think about it, how to access it, that kind of thing. So that was Stephen Quillen. Now, in the big middle of this book, you get, just get rid of that book, you get the quiller wheel. So you can pull this out and this quiller wheel is what I absolutely love. You can look up actual colours if you're wondering where uh, to place it on the colour wheel. For example, Lemon Yellow tells you, there's a little circle there, that it sits just this side of yellow. So it's not a pure yellow, it's a yellow with a touch of green. And then there's Cadmium Yellow Light, which he actually lists there, and that's the perfect pure yellow. That's that's what he thinks, and I know that other people view, have different opinions. He also recommends a pure blue as Thalo blue, also Windsor blue. And cobalt blue is just this side of blue, so it's got a hint of warmth in it. And then I have magenta, which his wheel has as looking very purple, but the magentas that I buy are actually quite pink, so they really sit much closer to... Permanent rose, he also recommends quinacridone rose and permanent alizarin crimson. So he's got three recommendations of three pure colours. I love magenta because the magentas that I buy are quite pink. So you can see two yellows, two blues and two pinks. And with any two yellows, two blues and two pinks, you'll be able to um, paint everything that we're going to paint today. So there's my colours. I can move them. Oh, did I mention that I've got pears? Because that's our subject for today. I'm going to put these colours over here so they're accessible. Uh, now, I thought I would start with a little bit of, so here's what we're doing. We've got, we're going to do terminology and that's really fast. Basics, that's where I'd really love you just to ask me stuff because I don't know what you know, uh, though I do know that you know stuff. And colour schemes, this is where we'll begin painting. I'm only going to pick two schemes, there's heaps. And I thought I, we'd start off with a little bit of psychology. It is absolutely fascinating psychology. And so I'm going to put psychology of colour and then move it up so that you can see and I want you to put down a colour that feels like these feelings, let's say, uh, and see whether or not they match what psychologists suggest. These are theories. So for stability, you could put down any colour you want. And for powerful, you can put down any colour you want, passion, any colour you want, and romance, any colour that speaks to you. I'm going to paint over here a few swatches with a nice big brush, and I'm going to tell you what the experts suggest. I'm dipping straight into my phthalo blue, swatch it out, make sure there's no lumps, and this blue and an intense blue is suggested in colour psychology to be about stability and loyalty. Nice theory. And then I'm going to grab some of my, I'll just wash that a little better. This is permanent rose. If you mix permanent rose and blue, you get a beautiful purple. That's not really purple, it's very pink, and more blue, and you go to the purple side. So according to colour psychology, it's powerful and luxury power, I guess, and luxury <laughs> are um, represented by purple. Again, it's just a theory. It's a nice theory, lovely idea, but it's, I think it's a little bit like um, dream psychology too. Uh, just because you have a dream about a scratching your hand does not mean you're coming into money. It, it means whatever it means for you. It's not about... Um, what someone else thinks. Okay, we're coming up to passion and you can guess that one. And I've got this tiny bit of red on my palette because I don't use it much. But passion is about red versus the final one. Did you all pick that the final one is pink? 
which is about romance and being feminine and and hope. You know, occasionally they you go and you buy you donate a couple of dollars and they give you one of those. <laughs> Julie says all my choices excellent. Um, if you buy, you know, you donate a couple of dollars and they give you one of those little stick on things that goes on your shirt. And uh, if it's about hope or something feminine like breast cancer, bet it's going to be using pink. Um, so that's a really quick basics on psychology of color. And it is a theory. It's not at all fact. It's, it's um, uh, about wonderful ideas i love the idea of um this pink versus the red too hey thanks helen that's wonderful i'm going to dump this painting too and the next thing so that was i'm going to knock it off with this beautiful sepia that was psychology the next thing i want to talk about is terminology so let's do that next and this one's really really basic too. Okay, terminology. There we've got hue. Uh, for the longest time, I felt that hue was something that was complex and it's not. So if I put down, I go back to my beautiful blue, the hue is simply the name of the color. It's nothing other than Color, but they don't like to say the word color because color could refer to the value or it could refer to the intensity. Intensity. So when you're talking about the hue, all you're talking about is the label that you give it. So it could be blue, as basic as just blue, or it could be cobalt blue, it could be phthalo blue. You, um, the name is the or hue is the value is where you take some of that beautiful blue, and you get. Oh, I should just start dark, 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 dark here. And then you add water, 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 water. I'm washing my brush each time here, getting lighter, lighter, lighter. So value, I often refer to value as tone, um, but I think that value is the correct term. It gets lighter, 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 lighter as it goes up, and that is value. So it's not it's kind of a version of value, isn't it? A little bit like money. <laughs> In, if it's really intense, you've got a lot of it. If it's really, really pale, you got no money. Um, intensity is the other type and it comes up with lots of different names. So sometimes it's referred to as brightness, sometimes saturation, and sometimes it's about chroma. And when I discovered the word chroma, I thought that was really confusing too because I'm like, is it intensity? Is it brightness? Is it saturation? Is it chroma? But in fact, I reckon saturation is pretty cool way to describe it, but they all are about the same thing. And I'm just going to demonstrate that next. So again, stick with my beautiful phthalo blue because it's um, lovely and intense so easily. I'm just grabbing some. So here's blue. And on the opposite side of the color wheel, and I know most of you are going to know what is on the other side of the color wheel, and you've got yellow, and I've just dirtied my yellow, which is not ideal, and I'm going to mix up an orange. So as orange, this is not very intense, but you'll get the point. As orange moves towards blue, or blue moves towards orange, and these are opposites each other on the color wheel, then they start to de-intensify or de-brightness or desaturate. And that is a term that you would hear a lot, desaturation. And that's where it gets confusing because if it's value, isn't that desaturation? Well, I reckon technically it is. But what they're referring to is the graying down of a colour. So adding a colour to its complement and then uh, mixing it together. And a lot of artists work in that beautiful zone there because it's so beautiful to work with. And we're going to be doing that automatically because we'll be mixing the colours on the page when we paint our pairs. So that's terminology. 
Uh, the other thing that I'm going to tell you again <laughs> is the basics. If you've got any questions, I'd really love you to ask, but I won't tell you again um, <laughs> because I don't want to bore you. Uh, so the last one are colour schemes. Now, if I go back to Stephen Quiller, so I get his book again, this, <laughs> he goes right into it in depth. I get rid of my wet painting. So he starts with warm and cool and then when I skip over, he starts to book about complementary colour schemes, so that's red and green. Look at those examples and they're extraordinary. And then he goes into a split complementary scheme that's coming up, hold on, analogous colour schemes, which we're going to do, uh, analogous, there it is, high key, uh, analogous semi-neutrals, you can see why this book it will just keep you going for years. It's wonderful. Split complementary uh, colour scheme, semi-neutrals with direct, it goes on and on. And then he gets into transparent, translucent and opaque. Oh, <laughs> transparent, translucent and opaque. I'm actually going to skip that part at that aspect of watercolour today because there is so much that I could include about colour. Um, that I needed to pare it down and that's why I thought I'd go for terminology, basics, schemes and a little bit about psychology. But we could absolutely come back to the schemes again, um, possibly when we finish this lovely series of shape and colour and line and value, form, texture and of course today is all about colour. We're only on to the third one. We've done line, we've done shape we've, and today is colour and then the next session is going to be on value and I've already scheduled that one so you could uh, click on it and it will notify you and um, why on earth I had technical problems this morning I don't know anyway this book will just keep you going and going and uh, I really wish that I could get <laughs> a lovely um, uh, commission on these books because of how often I have recommended his book Okay, let's get painting. Let's think about colour schemes. I've got some paper and I'm going to start off with the method that most of you are going to be using. I'm painting on my Baohong block. It is the student grade of Baohong. And I've got a paper plate and um, then I'm just trying to put it into here. Transparent, translucent, opaque, another day. Oh, doesn't that make a, tr a top topic, Helen? Oh, that is just fantastic. Um, yeah, I'd watch a video on that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to zoom out now so you can see my palette, I hope. Oh, yeah, that worked. Okay, there's my palette. Here's my pears, which is our subject. Move that up there and over there. And, okay, I'm just centering all of that. Great. My water was actually clean when I began. <laughs> um, oh, the other thing I thought I might use today, and I know this really relates to texture, um, but I thought that I, I've had it in the cupboard for ages. A student showed me, or did I get it? Oh, no, I got it from a YouTube video, I remember. Anyway, it's this plasterer's textural stuff I think they use it to give something um, strength anyway I'm going to use that for a little bit of texture today you buy it at Bunnings in a roll like that anyway I'm going to have that on the side ready for when I'd like a little bit of perhaps a tabletop right I'm going to center this oh no I'm not you know what would be cool is to put in some notes on the side and that way we can talk about you can put some information on the right hand side that you're going to be using in your color scheme especially if your paper is much larger like mine is going to get a pencil and ever so delicately trace around the paper plate i'm doing this one because most of you won't have round paper and then i'm going to paint next on the round paper that I uh, bought online and I've no idea whether it's going to be awesome but we will discover that. For now we're going to paint in a circle so I'm 
aware that you won't be able to see my circle there, but you will when I start painting. And the other thing about this is that I've been incredibly pale because I would like to erase it and I just like to keep within that um, circle. Now, uh, these colour schemes. Let's talk about which colour scheme. My most favourite colour scheme, and I'll get the colour wheel back again. My most favourite colour scheme is to work in complementaries. So anything that's perfectly opposite each other on the colour wheel is a complementary. So our pairs don't really have red and green in them, but I don't care. I paint for I use color for joy I don't use color if the pair is yellow sometimes I do love to take my um, inspiration from the real color especially with leaves that's just wonderful but today I want to not use yellow and purple partly because I already used that on this other painting I'm just grabbing it excuse me but this is an example of a triad. I've used yellow, purple, and um, green. Oh, could I say that's a triad? Yellow, purple, and green. No, that's not really, it's not really even making much of a triangle, so I'm not sure that is triadic. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you play with colour and understanding whether it's a split complementary, a triadic scheme, all that kind of stuff is just interesting, but it doesn't um, affect completely <laughs> the way that I paint and when I say completely because sometimes I love to think about it for example today let's paint with a red and a green if you love this idea of using complementary colors and this is a complementary color scheme so uh, you could use any two opposites you could use yellow and purple I pretty much never do that because I don't love the complementary grey that those two, when they neutralise, I don't like them. But the red and the green, the neutral that that makes, I absolutely love. Phthalo and cadmium scarlet, which is an orangey red, uh, they come together and they make a beautiful um, complementary colour. But my favourite is red and green. So I'm going to just clean off... How pretty is my wheel right now? But I'm going to just clean up my wheel, quick, my palette, I should say. While I'm doing that, um, HIT says, Hi, Mary, my biggest problem is watercolour dries a lot lighter. How to mix a colour with correct intensity? And if not, too light or too dark, how to fix? Oh, wonderful. Thank you for that question. And um, that's something that we'll... I'm going to try and keep in mind as I go. And if I don't answer it along the way, please ask again because that's a great question. I'm going to put out on my palette a red. And when I say a red, they, I just use pinks. I don't actually use many reds unless I'm painting something specific like a red poppy. Otherwise, I use magenta, which my magenta is quite pink. And I'm going to not mix it with Viridian green because the green that I've got on my um, – palette for my pure green now is phthalo green and I'm totally aware it's not a pure green I just love it so let's mix some color I'm going to grab a brush and um, start oh not that one I was going to go for so that you know what I'm doing permanent rose grab some permanent rose now just to answer your question a little bit h-i-t h-i-i-t <laughs> Um, it was about how to mix a colour with correct intensity. Right. So to help answer that question, in my palette here, I've got thick, thick, thick pink there, loose, runny pink there, but it's quite intense. And then I mix that intense colour there. So I begin with very little water and an intense colour. And then when I add that colour to my palette, that's when I start to make it light. 
I also like to use separate brushes because the other thing that I noticed students did all the time was uh, they'd get out some color and they, they liked to use one brush. And I understand that in the way that um, you get a favorite brush and you know how it behaves, that's really quite good. But I thoroughly recommend you buy another. And that is exactly what I've done there. These are the exact same brush. So I know how these behave and I use separate colors, separate brushes quite often for separate colors and it's not just because I don't want to mess up the color that doesn't bother me in the least in fact messing up the color there's my intense so very little color very little water sorry you get that beautiful intensity of color I'm going to mix these two on my palette but just to see what they look like I'm going to mix in the middle there and that is the magnificent uh, color that is between my phthalo green and the pink. Uh, then I'm going to mix water over here and that's where I'll begin to, um, to control the color. But also just um, making my camera zoom in. Also to answer your question about too light or too dark, you need to remember that watercolor dries. Just move that up a bit. Watercolour dries 10-ish percent lighter because the water makes the colour more intense and then when the water evaporates, you're left with just the pure colour. So I just adjust for that constantly. Okay, I've got this circle on here. Now, I'm sorry that you can't see it, but I want to start by putting in some of this lovely colour and then out of that, we'll um, make some pairs I think what I'll do is uh, draw into it and that'll be quite quick for you to see. I use a big brush, got dirty water, so that might be absolutely perfect. Uh, here's my water. I'm going to not drip on my pretty space. I am covering the whole thing, covering, and I'm going to go close to the edge, but I'm going to be erasing it later. So I don't want to cover the pencil because we all know that means that you can't erase it later. So I've got a lovely pale, just zoom out. See, the camera constantly gets confused about where to focus. Okay, and then I'm going to drop in some of this beautiful green. Oh, shall we just paint, go straight in and paint pairs? Yeah. Okay, let's paint a green pair and dump that one. And, oh, I've changed the colour already. And then I'm going to drop in some pink and water, just water. <laughs> that was pure fun. I'm going to um, get some pure pink, which is over here in the little palette there. So I'm going to do it again. I'll do it over here. I'm just doing a fat shape coming up to a, <laughs> a, a smaller fat shape. Then I'm going to put the green into the red. So this is a complementary color scheme, red and green. And then a little bit of water. It doesn't look at all like a pear. So the other thing that's kind of to your question is about the wetness is that see how the pink has rushed over and that's because the viscosity of my pink is matching the water so that it moves quickly. The viscosity of my green was not matched, it was thicker so it moves less and viscosity just of course refers to how wet your page is, how wet your paint is. The viscosity is wetness. I'm going to do over here another one, a little one. And again, I'm doing a little bump on the bottom and then coming in with my other colour. Little bump, big bump on the bottom, little bump on the top. <laughs> I'm going to come back in with more pink and fat and small fat. And that's not a pear shape at all. But what does it matter? At the moment, we are playing with colour. Okay. Because I wet to the edge, it's doing the most beautiful thing on its own, just moving around the page. Here's where I'm going to grab a 
watercolor crayon this I need a green and a red reds I've got lots of and it actually tells you the color on this I don't really have a pink but that'll have to do I'm afraid red and then this I think is green let's see yes okay I'm going to get the pear shape and I'm going to draw the pear shape so let's give it a stalk and let's come down and give a pear shape so a fat round and an even fatter bottom and draw back into there and not put that on my <laughs> paper and here come in with the red with the green such a shame I don't have a pink but I need to expand these colors because I'm using them more and more back to the green over here I really don't love that red but I'm going to do another one over here a fat bottom come up and back down to the fat bottom green look uh, can you see how it's just pushing it away it's doing such magnificent things I'm just gonna go over it again same line and give it a stalk fat bottom small fat top come down there that's lovely and I don't think I'll come oh no I've used a bit of the red so I do like that theory if you used it there use it somewhere else so just a bit and then over here I'm going to put another one green 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 stalk big stalk and a little bit of red this one we're going to let dry it's really rather lovely and I have kept away from the outside which means that I can erase it and it's not looking much like pears at the moment but we could come back in and increase that so I did one two three just wet in wet and most of that has been lost but that's okay and then I've come back in with the uh, marker I've just put in put paint all over those and let's try out the oops let's try out these watercolor papers that you can buy okay it's focused excellent so it just came with plastic and this just comes straight off and it's bound so I quite liked that I'm going to, that, but that's the brand if you go looking for it in case it turns out nicely, Arteza 20 Sheets. I was so disappointed that it was this, um, <laughs> this, I just, this camera drives me nuts. I have to do something about the camera. It's such a big expense. Anyway, uh, this, <laughs> when I bought it online, I was expecting it to be this size. I like this size. I don't really like painting small. Uh, Julie says the lost makes a great background doesn't it yes and um, I really really love all that softness it's it's kind of um, inviting uh, so assuming that you don't have one of these I would suggest you do another circle so that we can paint in another color scheme I'm going to carefully move that keep it flat because there's a big oh I know what I need to do okay because I want this to I want to paint on this later I'm going to get a tissue and ever so delicate lay that down and lift and get rid of that I was trying ever so delicately to not let that go outside and again down and lift just to pick up that excess color and down and up that's just going to allow that to dry a little more evenly mind you I do love um lovely backgrounds sometimes Helen says if you're doing wet and wet can it make a more intense pigment with these absolutely with these well yes I guess so so if you're doing wet in wet and you use a really thick color like practically straight out of the tube then absolutely 
then you will get a more intense pigment and more intense colour. Isn't That's another word we use all the time to describe colour too, isn't it? Pigment. There's so many uh, words when you start to think about the terminology in colour. Okay, I'm going to let that one dry and switch to the little one. Get rid of that and hope that this is going to be lovely. It's got an opening somewhere. It's got an opening there. So that's how I'll remove it. And everywhere else seems to be bound. It's not bound particularly well. It, it will be very interesting. Okay, we've just done the colour scheme that was a complementary. Just getting my colour wheel back. We've just done a colour scheme that was a... Um, colour scheme where it is opposite each other and that's called a complementary colour scheme. I've got some notes here for myself so I'd remember to tell you stuff. Uh, colour schemes, put it that side. We've just done the complementary colour scheme which is just means opposites. A split complementary scheme is where you take one colour, say you take yellow, its complement is blue, is purple, but you paint with, say, magenta and ultramarine. And between magenta and ultramarine, you get purple. So a complement is the opposite, and a split complement tends to mean, and you can take it to mean whatever you like, um, but a split complementary scheme means that you split the comp one of the complements, or maybe you split both, I don't know. This is the one we're going to come back to, analogous. Triadic is really beautifully described with this triangle. So if you made a little paper triangle and you just flipped it around, this one starts with the three primaries, but you could rotate it and have orange, purple, blue, and you could rotate it again and have purple, magenta, green. It doesn't really matter. It's just a triadic. just means that you've got three colours that make a triangle. Um, yeah, so that's what triadic is, but analogous is what we're going to, and some people say analogous. Analogous is what we're going to focus on now. And when I was teaching the kids, I called them colour cousins. And that was such a lovely, sweet way of thinking about what an analogous colour scheme is. And if they're related, then they are analogous. So this time, maybe we do take our inspiration from the pair. Uh, so we've got greens. So I've got a green up here. It's got it's a yellowy green, so maybe I include some yellow. And it's got some browns. But if I use a brown that's close to these two, then I'll be coming up with an analogous colour scheme. But there really aren't many browns that are in that zone. So let's say we stick with the analogous colour scheme and make it simple for ourselves and we go yellow, green and maybe a bit of blue. Or we go green, yellow and maybe a bit of orange. That would work very nicely, wouldn't it? Let's do that. Green, yellow and orange. So they're related to each other they're, and therefore they're called colour cousins in a simple version and analogous for the technical name for colours that are closely related. And you could, of course, paint with some tertiary colours in the middle here and some grayed down colours, which are also called neutrals, um, but I'm going to keep it simple and keep it on the outside of the colour wheel and I'm going to go orange, yellow, green. I hope that all made sense. Get rid of this and let's paint on here. Now, a little bit of thinking this time for where we're going to head. And thank you to the person who gave me a thumbs up. I really appreciate that you all came and found me again. And uh, there's only one person that's given me a thumbs up. So please give me a thumbs up. I know that I sound so dull as I say it. So there's a thousand ways that we could um, needy. That's what I sound like. <laughs> I'm going to paint a big pair. And so to the quick way of drawing a pair is to do, oh, I'll do it on the back of here. Quick way of drawing a pair is to draw a fat bottom and a 
egg shape on top and big stalk and then you smooth it out. Julie says, me. <laughs> I'm not sure. When... <laughs> me, you're the person that gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right, I'll leave that there so you can see that one. And ooh, I'm going to keep this close by too because wouldn't that be lovely down there with a bit of texture on for this one, I'm going to be doing a single pair with a split complementary scheme. No, no, we're doing analogous. Here's my green already there. I don't need these crayons this time. I've already mixed up this colour in the middle there and I need to get rid of that. So a bit of water there to get rid of it. I am going to be using red, but it's not much of a red. No, I'm not using red. I'm making orange. I'm doing orange, yellow, green. And they're not colours that I often paint with, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that you paint with colours that you like. A lot of people paint intuitively. And one way of thinking about intuitive painting is that you are just painting with colours you like. Because uh, in painting intuitively is not thinking about it, but you really are accessing knowledge without thinking about the fact that you're accessing knowledge. Here's my green. Now, this brush is going to be too big for this small paper. So I'm going to get rid of that one. And with a clean brush, my, this water, this water over here is not particularly clean, but it doesn't matter. Here's Cad Yellow Light. Put a batch there. That's thickish. So I will get an intense yellow there. And then I need to make orange. So I'm going to go back to that same beautiful pink and add that over here. Oh, just push it big. Make it big and make orange. How do you make orange? Yellow and red. But it works with yellow and pink. There's my three colours and part of the beauty of this colour wheel is that you can um, see how beautifully things relate. I really love working with a round palette for this reason is that I'm constantly confirming the relationship between the colours by working on a round palette. This is an, an analogous scheme and the other thing that these schemes do is just limit the number of colours and some people do use them purposefully but I don't care whether you do or don't, doesn't matter. Now, let's start with this green. And this green is beautifully intense because it's thick. Now, I'm going to get water, more water. It's a wonderfully intense colour, unlike yellow. And I'm going to add a little yellow to it, actually, to make it a little, yeah, that's lovely. A bit more yellow, a bit more yellow. I'm not attempting to approximate the colour on the pair. I spent years doing that kind of thing. Oh, I'm letting the orange go in too. I spent years approximating colours to get the colour right and I, I now never do it because I don't care whether I get the colour right or not. So let's paint the shape first and I'm just going to centre it and I'm going to paint a lovely big fat bottom, add water. It's continuing the fat bottom, fat bottom, fat bottom, and just water. I'm just washing my brush over and over to get a light side. And it's nearly a pear shape like that. Back to my green and paint in the egg shape at the top. Egg shape there. And the stalk into that. I'm going to drop some orange, 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 orange. That's <laughs> not really looking very lovely, is it? So I need to get rid of the orange and come in with the yellow, yellow. Oh, that's so much better. Yellow. And also yellow is a light colour, so lovely that it would be on the light side. Sometimes 
I forget to finish my sentence once I begin focusing. Okay, that's lovely. Now let's pick up a little more intense colour. So this is thick, very little water. And add a lovely intensity over there. And it's got this dip bit here, so I'm going to put in a bit of colour there. And um, I'll just lift off a little highlight. Or, oh, I know, let's leave it there and go straight into the background and get some beautiful rushing of um, colour to the outside. <clears throat> now, I mentioned that I want to put this on. Oh, I think I'm going to take a risk. I want it to, to look a little bit like it's sitting on a surface. So the thing about this tape is that it's got <laughs> a tiny bit of glue on the back. So I'm going to lift off and I'm going to get a little pattern there. But I'm going to try not to do that edge too much. Maybe lift off again there because that's pure fun. And then I'm going to put some colour down here. Now let's say we're going to stick with the complementary colour scheme. I could put the orange down the bottom, but I, I really don't love that orange. So what about if I make it much more yellow <laughs> and I'm mixing yellow, red and making that orange, but there's a bit of green in it. So it's going to the brown side. I am without thinking much, I'm neutralising my green and I'm going to paint in this color on the base there little bit of color I don't know exactly what it's going to whether it's going to work properly now this is light over here so as I go over there pick up that thick color and go dark thick less water and you automatically go darker and when we come to value in a couple of weeks, which is our next subject, then um, unfortunately I can't do next Wednesday. I have to do boring doctor stuff. Okay, let's take this off. But I have scheduled the next one for the week after. It just splattered absolutely everywhere. Oh, loving the effect though. That is really, really cool. And it's got a line there. So I'm really, really liking that. So I don't want more orange in my painting because I don't like orange. I've got a mass of green. So that leaves me with yellow. And I could um, grey down the yellow if I want to. But I'm not going to. I'm just going to go straight in to a background of yellow. And in, I'll go right to the edge. Bit of water to go. That's dirty water, so that will neutralize the yellow automatically. And then enjoy with a bit of water coming down and touching the pear so it's nearly dry. <laughs> And there is one of the many joys of watercolour. Look at that colour just moving out there like that. I'm going to oh, keep that for yellow, that brush. Uh, so it's rushing out really beautifully. This is the pale green. So I'm going to put some green. And we've stuck completely here a little bit of splatter. We've stuck completely to a limited palette. Okay, I'm going to grab the yellow again. It's the only time I'm washing my brush. And go over here. And this side, I'm going to touch this lovely grid I've made. And a bit of water to take it up to here. Soften that edge. Come around. And I'm being... I'm just touching that edge as well. So this edge isn't as wet as this one was, which was just moving beautifully. So I'm going to put the green back in and touch the yellow. And if it's lovely and thick, it's going to just gently creep out. Get some thick, more thick green and put the stem back in. And maybe the stem comes down and has a bigger impact. Go into the wet. If I want to really see it, thick paint, very little water. I'm going to have to reestablish that there, aren't I? 
and come in with this grey because I ruined that. Oh, I think what it needs, come back in. This is all beautifully already. Ah, oh, PJ Primadonna says so vibrant and Hit says amazing already. Thank you. I love, 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 love that. Now, I think I'm going to get a little bit of it because in the same way that I like to see um, a colour here and then repeat it over there. Oh, just said that out loud and I'm going to do it straight away. That yellow. In the same way that I love to see colours repeated in other areas. Oh, and I think it needs to go on here as well. Mm, I'm going to ruin the pattern though, aren't I? Put it there just to satisfy myself. This is the only brush. I can't say that enough. It's the only brush that I'm washing lots. So what I was thinking is, oh, I just dripped water there accidentally. What I was thinking is that it could do with a bit of texture there. So tissue, you could just do salt if you've got some salt handy and lift off. And then I'm going to get, I hope, <laughs> too much paint came off uh, okay I think I'll just do it again do it up here I pressed really hard uh yeah that's nice now put some over am I gonna overdo it if I go again yep I'm overdoing it <laughs> it's the it's such a wonderful um, balance that you have to tread when you're painting about joy versus a, a, an outcome, a painting that you might enjoy. Okay. Now, this is the point. Going back to Hit's question, I hope I'm saying that right, is about um, light and dark. This is the point at which you think. So I'm coming towards the end. So I'm thinking, thanks, Anne. Anne says, that's so cool. I'm coming towards the end, so I'm thinking to myself, is my green dark enough? And if you say to yourself, yes, and it's still wet, then it's not dark enough because it's going to dry 10% lighter. So a little more dark, a little more dark, a little more dark. And again, a little more dark. Of course, you can let it dry and redo it. That's the alternative. I'm not going to add much to there because that is so beautiful. But I wonder if I could add it in little tiny dots because that, if I do a line, I'll ruin that beautiful pattern that's occurring there, there, and up. I'm going to redo the stem because I quite, I like the idea that it you can see it. It's got a soft edge because of the wet in wet. Um, but uh, that little bit of plasterer's tape, I'm pretty sure that's what it's called has worked very nicely. That is a analogous colour scheme. We stuck to three colours that are related to each other. So that's why they're also called colour cousins. I love that idea. Now I splattered a little bit of green into the yellow and um, I won't repeat that there. That's a little bit boring. That I put a little bit of texture there and um, it's just bothering the hell out of me. So I don't want green on it. I'm going to get this neutral colour and um, put just cover it very quickly. It's all wet. There's a weird line on my page there. This paper, that's my, my third, third swatch. <laughs> Apologies for that sound effect. Um, and I think the paper is doing something a little weird. And that's a little sad. I don't know whether or not that means it's going to transfer um, through it. But often you get that pigmentation. I'm just going to zoom in so you can see what I'm talking about there. Often when you get that pigmentation happening, let's show you zoom right in so you can see up. It is occurring there. So firstly, two lines have occurred, and I don't think I touched it with the ferrule. Secondly, it's doing this weird pitted thing. It's, and it's not granulation, <laughs> which I love granulation, but it's not granulation. I'm zooming. Anyway, I'm not very excited anymore about this paper trying to put it back in the centre and make it 
focus. Excellent. All right. So I've talked about the, uh, oh, look, I've got a hard line, a soft line. I love that um, combination. I've got some light tones and some dark tones. I really like this um, textured mark on the bottom. I got rid of the textured mark I put in the background. Mm. They're a little bit twee, so I'm just, I don't know why they're bothering me, but they're drawing focus, which is nice, but for some reason it's bothering me. A little bit of yellow. Well, that was a little too watery. And so it just had no impact. A bit of yellow in amongst the grid. Oh, that's beautiful. Right. So this one, because it was so wet, it's just mixing in and moving colour around. This one had the beautiful intense yellow pigment. And so uh, there was more pigment than water and that's why it behaved in that way. Uh, so up there, I'm going to grab more of the thick stuff. So where I'm doing that... I'm dipping straight into the thick, thick, thick paint. That's a bit better. It's just broken that little um, grid look up a little bit. I am enjoying that process so much. I feel a little bit like I want to keep going with the grid, but ooh, I think that might be a moment to switch to the other one. And that way... We can finish off the other one and come back to the second one. And, um, yeah, Julie says, oh, dear, a bad batch perhaps. Still looks great, though. Yeah, it does still look good. Thanks, Julie. And that's right, you, you occasionally get bad batches, but there was another brand I saw of round paper. I'm just going to zoom out while I get my other painting. How's it looking? Oh, I've had some fabulous granulation go on. Look at the comparison between these two colour schemes. And this takes us back to colour psychology. This has an intensity to it that it, it's certainly um, about something that is almost serious or passionate. And whereas this one has a lightness to it, I think, um, <laughs> Julie says, are so colours more bossy? Are uh, so colours more bossy? Are, are some colours more bossy? Is that yes? Yeah, some are some colours more bossy? Absolutely, that is a brilliant way to describe them. Many colours, particularly the phthalos, will push other colours around, and many of the yellows will just be subjugated, uh, for want of a better word. Uh, things of uh, most colours will dominate and boss around the yellows, which is why if you're going to use them in watercolour, you really need to kind of give them a protection, just like a, a small child that requires protection because they're not standing up for themselves yet. Uh, yellow is, is incapable of standing up for itself. So in watercolour, we protect it. We use it in areas where uh, you don't go over them again or you protect it by using masking fluid or tape, something like that. And when you're working in another media, yellow can just be added at the end. But in watercolour, you do need a little bit of planning. Um, but, of course, in watercolour, you get these magic things happening. So for me, watercolour just always wins. Right, back to this one here. What does it require? And now, firstly, I can erase my circle because I left it um, untouched. There was no paint on my circle. I am going to be careful, though, because I don't want to grab a little bit of that paint. It's nearly, nearly, nearly wet. It's nearly, nearly dry, too. <laughs> it's the same thing, isn't it? All right. Okay, we're at the final um, stage of deciding what to do. I could just come back in with, oh, I've, weirdly, I'm enjoying the red now. That's, that's very interesting. I'm going to try very hard just to stick with the two colours. It is so tempting at this point to um, come in with another colour. And, of course, you can do that if you want to. You, you always get to do exactly as you please. But if I'm going to continue to demonstrate a uh, complementary colour scheme, I need to stick to red and green. And, of course, it was, in fact, pink, wasn't it? One of the ways you can decide about what to do is, in terms of colour, is do I have 
um, have I allowed one of the colors to win? So if you look at this and you squint a bit, which color is winning? At the moment, green is just winning and the pink is being subdued a little bit. So what I might do is make the green really win. So I could do that with this green. I think that's green, isn't it? I'm going to test it over there. I could do that with this green um, crayon again. Look how tiny this little thing is. Look, they break. Well, I break them. I'm not going to totally blame the product. So what about if I start by putting in more green? That's having very little impact. Okay. I think then I'm going to dry it and glaze it. Now, my microphone will allow me to keep talking. It's a really cool microphone. It's a Rode microphone. And what it does is allow me to keep talking at the same time as drying. And what I'm doing as I'm drying is deciding what I'm going to do. I've got one, two, three pairs. And will I enhance them further or will I enhance the others that were already there? So I'll make that decision based on how much I like them and I don't like that one much at all. And I don't really like this and I don't really like this. Okay, I'm going to invent new ones and glaze. And I think I will glaze with green. So I've got green here. I'm going to need to get rid of these other colours. This green I'm using is Thalo Turquoise and it is a beautiful, beautifully transparent colour. I want to get rid of the orange because I'm not including that in this painting. Okay, here's my really intense green, uh, less intense green. And over here. I'm going to put a bit more pale green. And um, the paler your colour is, which means the more water you've got in your glaze, the easier it is to glaze, to paint. Okay. Now I need to get more of that red out. So, and when I say red, I'm today I mean permanent rose. I don't paint with red. I hope I haven't said that too much. And okay, now I'm not going to enhance these existing ones. I absolutely love that shape there, that beautiful soft shape there. And these are the original pairs that I began with. They are kind of like that. I didn't dry it enough for me to put a pencil mark in. So let's wing it. Let's start. I'll turn it around to help my... Um, let's start with this one and now, right, I was thinking that I wanted to, but I do need to put in the pencil mark. I'm going to press really lightly. There's the bottom round, bottom round and the top. And then there'll be a stalk. I'm going to paint one at a time, which is tricky because... It will mean that I need to work very quickly or I'll use water to soften out the edge. There's my pale green and it goes up to there. So I'm going to do one side first, paint out, switch to water, keep going out. I'm just going to soften that off. I know that's going to make a line, but that's all right. There's other lines there. Now I'm going to go back to my green, thick green, and intensify. Thick green and also make that lovely and round, round and it's gone into the colour that was there and oh I was thinking that I would go green, green, green but maybe I'll switch. Okay I'm going to just outline the stem. Okay water, water, wash it all off and move quickly around to here and grab my pencil. So I've got one there and I'm going to do one here. Fat round, fat round for the bottom. Oh, there's the beautiful pair I was going to use. Damn it. 
Hmm. Shall I change my mind? That's so beautiful. Nah. Go. Just go with what I've got. Fat. That's way too fat. And that's too fat. Yeah, that was worth drawing. I wonder if I can erase it on this. It's so slightly damp. Okay, if you can see those marks later, I'll think about adjusting it then. I want to get going with the green and the green. I'm just using water at the moment. I'm not going to be careful about going to the edge because it can look beautiful. And here's my thick green so that you can see the beautiful outline of the pear and like that. It's got a stem. I'm going to have to solve that later. And yeah, no, I'm going to con continue with the uh, green. So watery, watery green. Not much of a pear shape, is it? There, a little bit rounder, rounder, there. Okay, slightly more intense green. No, water, I remember. Water over there, softening off the edge, soften, soften. And then come back in with my beautiful. Helen says, love the light coming through the pale areas. Me too. Thank you, Helen. Right, it, this is the intense, intense green. And as I say, I've got no stalk. I'll deal with that later. All right, go around again. I'm aiming for threes. And so there's one there, one there, and I'm going to put one here. Maybe it'll be a bit smaller. Or maybe there's two over here. Maybe, or maybe it's too complex if I go through. Yeah, right, stick. Um, one there, one there. I won't go too even. Oh, these colours are going to be beautiful within a pair. That's a good way to choose what to do. Fat bottom and it goes up into there. Now it's all wet there, so I'm not going to paint. I'm not going to draw in it, that's for sure. All that happens if you draw into it, I'm going to do this side first. All that happens if you draw onto damp paper, just making it more of a pear shape, is that you will bruise the paper. It goes right in, soften, soften, and go into the intense, beautiful. This is a, turning out to be a pretty good example of complementary colours and how beautiful they make each other look. And there's masses of um, the mixtures where the two colours have come together and made a type of grey. Okay, now... Do I go back and do the other sides with the same green and just have the pink pears popping out? Do I neutralise it a little bit? Ooh, so I'm going to trial it. I can always increase. So I'm going to mix my green and red together and do the other side of the pears. So this pear is here, comes to here and around around and then water out soften all of that and that's that's the only one with the stem at the moment and then oh for intensity maybe i'll go into the pink mm, does it look as beautiful as the i totally miss where my line went <laughs> does it look as beautiful as the green no it really doesn't okay there's a pear shape there and I didn't mean for that so I'm just going to soften that a little bit so maybe that will be the only one I do in the pink okay keep moving around I've done one I've oh I've done two there you go that's funny I felt like I'd only done doesn't matter <laughs> am I crazy pink uh, this is the mixture. It's a greyish colour. It's mixing green and red. And it really is a beautiful greyish colour. Mix that together. 
and I'll do stems in a middle in, in the middle in a minute and I there <laughs> I was searching for where I was up to intensify with green because I intensified with pink on the other one I didn't like it intensify there well, I wonder if I could get enough thick green, thick, 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 loaded on my brush and do a stalk. Yep. Okay. Then, oh, I know, I'll switch to this red. And I can't say enough how sometimes just having a limited number of brushes really helps because there it is fully loaded that's got a stem, that's got a stem. This one can have a stem that goes up and touches that one. That looks really strange, so I'm going to bring that down there and out there. Go back to that lovely watery colour. Watery, watery. Whoops. <laughs> I went into the bear. Uh, now. Remember that I said at the beginning I wasn't being careful about the round shape? Well, that's the effect of not being careful about your round shape. Um, and this is also the effect of not planning it out. I, I know the concepts for planning it out and I sometimes institute them. And when I'm teaching, I usually talk about planning it out because I know you will get a better result. But this series has given us the opportunity to play. So we're not focusing all the time just on composition and making things work. We're being quite playful. Um, so there's elements of this that really are very beautiful and playful. I think that it is um, too wet to do anything else, so I'm going to dry it again. have a look through here. I've got this white crayon and I'm going to put a little mark on to see what it yeah see it just moves paint around. Thought it might do that. Just clean that off. And I thought white might be beautiful to finish off. This would be a great exercise to redo and preserve some of the white of the paper with masking fluid. Using masking, excuse me, if using masking fluid on YouTube Live, that was a little bit problematic because of the time it takes to dry and I don't like to apply heat to it. So what I want to do is increase these beautiful shapes to make them clearer. Because at the moment it's pretty, the colours are working because we limited the colours and we're working with complement. So that aspect to it is lovely, but I want to enhance, and I think I'll do it with a yellow, with a white. <laughs> and white does not appear on the colour wheel. And that's because white is the absence of colour. Some theories say that black is all of the colours mixed together and... Oh, I was just reading Helen's comments. Soften any of the circle edges. Hmm, interesting. Do you mean with my white or just by softening, bring it out to the circle? Interesting. Because it might actually soften with this. Nice little bit there to dry. And there. Okay, we're ready for final touches. Got this white one. And the beauty of a circle, of course, is you can turn that any which angle you like. Uh, that one's a tiny bit wet there, so I think I'll turn it around. 
with water, soften. Oh. So Helen's suggesting I'll get a clean brush. I don't have overly clean water, but Helen's suggesting a little bit less. That soften some of these edges with water. Risky because um, I'm going to create some backgrounds, but let's see if we can. I mean, does it matter if I create backgrounds? Oh, so I could soften it where the pears are. Soften that edge. Or I could do the opposite. You guys could soften the pear itself, or you could soften the. I'm just cleaning my brush each time and make that one go around. Interesting how different I've made the bottom of that look. And here's my other one. I'm taking it as a slight opportunity to make my circle a little more circular. Just rubbing those. Interesting, isn't it? What it's doing there. Just correct that edge a little. Hmm. Oh, isn't that pretty what it did on the edge? Anyway, back to my white. I want to enhance one, two, three pairs. And now I've wet them again <laughs> uh, with white. Taking a big risk, but always worth a big risk. Yeah, that's what I want. I want to be able to, for the viewer to know, this is the pair. I know it's um, abstract, but at the moment it's not at all clear. I'm doing this side. It's not at all clear that it is a pair. It's too abstract. And a stalk, so that one can go into there. Break up that big batch of green. And come around again is this one. It's slightly damp, so it's not sitting on top as nicely and starts to pick up paint. But when it's dry, it goes on. It's lovely, actually, wet down there where it's soft up there. And that stalk can go in to that direction. Oh, yeah, it was already there, but it had been lost. Okay. Still on the abstract side, I was thinking that might just do it. But I think I do need to enhance the other side. So I could go inside or I could go outside, just softer. And outside. It's lovely in the dark. And I think that makes more sense for the colours for the shapes, that, is, that it's more likely um, speaking of the pear shape than before where it wasn't. This is confusing. Was it that one or that one? Helen says crayon is enhancing the glow. It's really helping, isn't it? It just needed something. Um, that one is not clear. I need to make this touch. I'll make that touch too. I was thinking I keep that um, soft, but I want it to say pear. Oh, that's better. And I like them um, touching. That's quite cool too. Got a really wonky circle, um, but that wasn't the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise uh, was to play with complementary colours, but it was also about changing the format because last week we talked about how the – the paper can dictate the format that you paint in. So we're breaking that by using a circle, not sticking to the um, rectangle that the manufacturer has uh, suggested that we do. Okay, are there any final suggestions for what this needs? For example, will I be going over the top if I come back in with this? lovely um, 
me lovely mesh do I is it clear enough what the okay I'm just gonna do it I'm gonna get a, a sponge wet it thoroughly in my water just get rid of the drips and see if I can lift a bit oh it's really rough on my um, beautiful sponge okay I love that sponge a student gave it to me so not doing that cheap sponge did that work oh I know I should get a tissue and yeah uh, it's cute but it went outside the line so to stop that I'll give it a little curve And then on the next one, over there or up there, change it around. Cheap sponge, thoroughly wet it. It can be the dirty water, that's all right. And yeah, that always works. And press. Sorry about the camera. Uh, just go in. That's better, isn't it? In, in. <laughs> in, in. I'm hilarious with those. Oh, these little white highlights, I think, um, are helping. I do. So I'm putting it on that side, that side, and I'll continue over there. And look at this dark, just asking to be broken up. Where's my sponge? Just use a different edge, and I'm going to go into that dark bit there. There, I squeezed out a little bit of water, so I don't know what that's going to do, apart from the fact that I've made a mess. Take it off. It's got the tiniest bit of glue on it. Yeah. So that has helped the tiniest bit. These are the times in watercolour painting or any painting, any drawing, any creative pursuit where you start to go, am I done? What can I do to make it better? Um, I think I've got a little flat brush here and I might, because this is a watercolour crayon, just go with Helen's idea and soften a little bit. I'm just going to soften that edge so that line isn't quite so defined but it's still there. I'm trying to be logical about which side. And it's kind of, that's quite nice. It's traveling a little bit. And um, just soften over there. Soften. That's lovely. Yeah, I think I'll do a little more. Soften just for some random bits. Soften. Soften up here because that's, uh, yeah, and that way I'm making them a little lighter and that's kind of cool because then the background can be that little bit darker. I think I'm nearly done. I think that it's reaching the point where it's not going to get that much better. I could fiddle and fiddle and fiddle and will it be better? I don't know. I think it's one of those moments where I might call it and say, that one is done. Let's look at the other one and see if anything needs to be added. And it's here. Just move this one aside. Okay, so we enhanced the dark while it was wet because we asked ourselves that question, is it dark enough? And if the answer was yes, then add more because it's not... <laughs> 
going to be dark enough or when it dries because it dries 10% lighter. I still really quite like this one. I don't think I'm going to do much with that at all. I'm going to allow it to completely dry on the block in the same way that I'm going to allow this completely on the block before I remove it. Uh, so our next session is going to be about value and I'm going to have to come up with a lovely new um, topic because we've done two types of fruit <laughs> and um, oh, um, oh, I know, do you know what's awesome in tone are trees. Trees can be completely brilliantly painted just with tone. Does uh, anyone like the idea of doing trees? Or um, because when it comes to value, the other thing that we can do is paint a landscape because value is going to be um, lots to do with um, painting dark to light and it might be a little bit to do with, um, I'm just going to focus that again, it might be a little bit to do with um, one colour. So a monochromatic colour scheme, we didn't cover that today. We coloured uh, different schemes. We started with the psychology and thank you for asking questions um, that you might have wanted answered and we did a little bit of terminology so I hope that that helped because there's lots that... Um, <laughs> um, Lena says love doing trees and Julie says see you in a fortnight thank you Mary and all the best at the doctors thank you yeah it's all fine you know I'm getting a little older and older and that's what happens trees for me all loose landscape so we, yeah so a loose landscape is harder to do with a monochromatic study but you know maybe that's what we should uh, have as our challenge for ourselves is a loose landscape using um, tone and trees again brilliant okay trees and landscape ah Brilliant. Trees are really popular and um, wonderful thing to practice too. And so um, awesome with a limited palette, such as a monochromatic palette, which uh, is all about where value is at. And today was all about colour. I thank you so much. Thank you for your thum thumbs up. Thank you for commenting. It's making it so exciting for me and uh, for the everyone, I'm sure, that you're um, making um comments and asking questions. I've really got excited about the uh, uh, painting this today. Colour is my absolute favourite in terms of uh, subjects, but I, even I need to practice trees. So um, I'm actually, I don't know, I even said it like that. I totally need to practice trees. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me. That's absolutely wonderful. See you in a fortnight. And we're going to be focusing on values. We've done line, shape, colour, value, and then we're going to focus focus on form. It's um, 11.06. I did want to show you my book. So if you do have, <laughs> Helen says Wednesday, best day of the week. And Hit says, love the class today. Thank you so, so much. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, if you've got a second, I'm going to show you my book because I would love it if you guys have a book that you've been doing as well where as we work through these exercises, we are – I'm just searching for my book and, oh, I know where it is. It's, I've got so many beautiful books to recommend for next week as well. I've, I've started that. I'm just going to dump that painting. I need to get rid of my palette. Just put the lid on. I love that lid. So that I can open, get rid of the sponge. So that I can open, I need to push the pears off. All right, now we're talking. So the book is getting more and more pretty. I've decided to st stick more stuff in. Julie says, Joanne Boone Thomas uses monochromatic landscapes and trees. All righty, I'm going to be watching her before next week. Um, so I've started to stick in more beautiful things. These would be a lovely example for a monochromatic landscape and you paint it all in one colour, which is what I'm – anyway, I'm starting to stick in more and more things, paintings that um, don't – aren't possible to make cards out of, paintings that no one's really going to buy. And this is my Elements of Art folder. We've done line, shape, colour 
In a fortnight, we're doing value and then we'll do form, texture and space. And there's the examples we did with the line. So I really hope that you're starting to put together a reference for yourself because as we go through these, it's so cool. Um, that's the page out of Linda Kemp's book, which is just, oops, stupid camera. That's the page out of Linda Kemp's book, which is has the best information about uh, shapes that I've ever come across. They're the famous paintings. We didn't do that today. Uh, and then we did dynamic diagonals with that funny little painting and inviting rounds with the sweet, um, sweet balloons. And then I've got space for today's stuff to continue on this journey. And I'm going to, I've got those gorgeous round um, paintings so that I can add some stuff into it. Thank you much so much, guys. See you in a fortnight for value. Bye.